The vote is under attack. You said that your refusal to certify was, quote, not based on any evidence. It's not based on any facts. It's only based on my gut gut. and my gut feeling. My own intuition. Are you going to certify the election results in November? If it sits where it stands right now, I won't. We live in a different world now. People need to understand that. I'm Todd Zwillick, and this is Breaking the Vote, our series where we track the ongoing assault on voting rights and efforts to undermine democracy in America. We're here to cover how the democratic process a lot of us take for granted is being attacked and exactly who's trying to wreck it. Now, that's a hard thing to get your head around. We still vote for members of Congress and senators. We still vote for president. The oaths get taken, the flags still wave, but underneath the surface, the foundation is cracking. Because bombarding the foundations of fair voting and voting representation isn't a side effect. It's becoming a strategy for an entire political movement. And we've had a front row seat to the assault. We watched as government official after government official after government official sat before the January 6th committee and recounted all the ways the former president of the United States, along with his lieutenants, devised ways to wrest control away from the people, steal an election, and stay in power. There was the stuff we all saw, like the insurrection, the storming of the Capitol, and trying to stop the 2020 election from being certified by force. There was the scheming behind the scenes, like the attempted political takeover of the Justice Department, and the outright fraud, the plot from the president's allies to replace Joe Biden's electors with fake ones not chosen by the voters. The attempted coup was broad and multi-fronted, and it didn't work. Or did it? The political theater of screen cap texts and presidential lunch being thrown at the wall seems like the story of the coup that failed, but it also tells the story of the next attempt. What if 2020 was just a dry run? What if all the flailing and desperate lying, what if the Rudy Giuliani of it all was just a stress test? The kind that can point out exactly where our democratic system is the weakest so that those weaknesses can be exploited the next time around. If all that sounds like, well, another conspiracy theory, then all you have to do is look at the people and the places who operated in 2020 and are laying the groundwork for 2024. This week, we'll take you from the larger-than-life plans that sought to install a tyrannical system in Washington to the conspiracies taking over and shaping local elections. And I sit down with the one man who might have the best view on voting, on criminal investigations of the president, and getting to the bottom of Trump's attempted coup, former Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder. But first, Liz Landers kicks us off in Alamogordo, New Mexico, following the first public official to be removed from their job for taking part in the January 6th insurrection as he threatened to hold the midterms hostage. You been staying busy? Oh yeah, yeah. So I think if we reset him, and then I'd like to put shoes on that, on that little black horse. All right. Come on. Hey, come on. Hey. <laughs> Boy, I'm watching the expression stubborn as a mule play out in real life right now. <laughs> a stubborn mule is the least of Coy Griffin's problems these days. How's the politics been going? Oh, you know, every day's a new battle. I got a deposition later this morning on a lawsuit where they're trying to remove me from office. I've seen something about that. So now they're going to try to use the courts. I don't know. I don't agree with it, you know? If the people of this area didn't want me to be their commissioner, that recall would have worked. Yeah, it's a circus race. Griffin was convicted of trespassing on the Capitol as part of the January 6th insurrection, in part on the basis of this video posted to his Facebook page. All right, y'all, we're here at the Capitol on the lawn. It's a great day for America. 
He founded a group called Cowboys for Trump and spoke at a QAnon conference. Don't ever let anybody shame you on January 6th. I wear January 6th as a badge of honor. But Griffin is also one of three Otero County commissioners, and he's being sued to be removed from office and possibly barred from public service. And despite all his far-right connections, he's on his own. What's up, Henry? This fly's eating you up. So you're not going to have a lawyer for this deposition. Why is that? Well, it's honestly, because I can't afford it. There have been, for some of the January 6th riders, people have gotten crowdfund stuff going and some deep-pocketed Republican donors have helped people out. Yeah. Have you gotten any of that? Are you disappointed you haven't no. gotten any of that? You know, I've I've been able to raise some money for, for uh, I raised about $20,000, I believe, that I spent on a group of attorneys out of Albuquerque on another case against the Secretary of State where they're trying to force me to register as a political action committee and I don't meet the legal requirements, but I, I raised some money from that. But yeah, it's disappointing. You know, I, I have an engagement letter with Sidney Powell. Sidney Powell is a friend of mine. She represented me in the Tenth Circuit a while back. She orally argued a case in the Tenth Circuit. But even defending the Republic and Sidney Powell are, have grown quiet. You know, it's like... Um, so you haven't heard from her recently? No. Uh -uh. No, I haven't heard from any of them. And they know what I'm going through right now. And it's just, I think the last time I uh, heard anything from Sidney, Sydney, I think she wished me luck. So you're kind of abandoned by this movement yeah, that you've abandoned, been. I feel like it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I know a lot of the bigger players, if you will, in this movement. But honestly, I believe the reason why I'm set by myself is because I can't be controlled. And I think that that's a threat. I think it's not only a threat to those on the right, it's a threat to those on the left. Griffin has other legal problems, too. He's facing trial for the money he raised through Cowboys for Trump, which the state says violated campaign finance laws. And then there's his latest issue. In June, Griffin and his fellow Otero County commissioners, who are all Republican, refused to certify the results of the county's primary election. So you want us to certify something that we can't even verify? Well, I mean, it's election law. I don't particularly want you to. I mean, it's the law. I have huge concerns with these voting machines. I really do. I don't, I just don't in my heart think that they can't be manipulated. Commissioners play no role in the administration of the election or the tallying of votes. And certification is usually a procedural non-issue. The New Mexico Supreme Court ordered the commissioners to certify the election or be removed from office. Two of them reluctantly did, which was enough to make the results official. But Griffin wouldn't do it. You you said in the county commission meeting when the results did not end up getting certified that your refusal to certify was, quote, not based on any evidence, it's not based on any facts, it's only based on my gut, my gut. and my gut feeling. My own intuition. So you, you didn't have evidence? I had evidence, and I could have You said you didn't, though. I could through the canvas. When our canvassers went and knocked on doors, and there was... 26. Why did you say in the county commission meeting you didn't have evidence though? Because, let me get to that. I had, we had evidence. I, I could have, I could have referenced the fact that our canvassers went and knocked on a house where there was 26 votes cast out of that, act, out of that residence and not a single one of those people lived there. I could have said that in the county commission meeting. I could have referenced the fact that um, Dominion won't let us inspect the machines. I could have, I could have given evidence and examples, but the reason why I said what I did is because that's all I need as a sitting county commissioner to cast my vote. That's the power of the vote. And that's, you know, I don't have to make my case to cast my vote. According to New Mexico state law, an official needs evidence to refuse to certify results. He's never produced any, but he's used his position to undermine the results and that's exactly what hundreds of other people like him across the country could do in future elections. Do you think that this episode in Otero County is a blueprint for the November midterms and for the presidential election in 2024? So if it was a blueprint, I think it was a poor one. Maggie Toulouse-Oliver filed a lawsuit to get the Otero commissioners to do their job. And as the Secretary of State, personally certified the election results. 
Uh, do I have a motion to vote after the presentation for the certification of the 2022 primary election results? So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, Great. That vote carries. I certainly hope that we've sent a very strong message that you either follow the law uh, or you will potentially be removed from office and someone else will follow the law. And I do think that it was really important to put this behavior to a stop as quickly as possible as we could in our state so that other counties in our state and other entities in other states didn't try to follow suit. Otero is a bright red county tucked in a state whose leadership is mostly Democratic. So Griffin hasn't succeeded, But Republicans in other states like Arizona, Nevada, and Michigan have focused on getting election deniers into Secretary of State jobs. And that's a crucial part of what some experts are saying is the plan to steal the 2024 elections. So we're at our NAS National Association of Secretaries of State Summer Conference. We have one every year. And really, this is our opportunity as secretaries of state of both parties from around the country to come together, share best practices, learn from each other. Hand counted, which I think would extend elections over years. Um, But if that is the case, then there's no technology to hack and and we don't have to to worry about that. So I just I think it's worth throwing out there and and discussing. So please, because I think we're all facing this. I think some of the folks who are advocating for hand counting are then going to be the same folks that say, why don't I have my election results at 10 p.m.? So I don't recommend hand counting. Otero County uses voting machines made by Dominion, a favorite target when Trump and his allies are peddling election lies. Robin Holmes' job is to make sure Otero's elections happen without any shady stuff. So we are in our voting machine warehouse. This is where we keep all of our voting machines. They're obviously all locked up. You all had elections here recently, primary elections in June. How did those go? So everything went great. All of our numbers were wonderful. We were very excited about all the work everybody had done to get to that point. There's a nationwide movement, I guess you could say, that's questioning the election results of still 2020, now of 2022 we're seeing, and probably 2024 and beyond. How does that make you feel about your job and your work? We've always taken pride in our work. We're very transparent. We're very fair. We invite anybody to come and watch us certify machines, watch how they actually work. We are actually going to bring um, a representative down from Dominion and um, schedule a meeting to get our Board of County Commission over just for them or whoever else would like to come and see, just look at the system. And if they have any questions, ask, you know, at that point. And I know our County Commissioner um, Griffin, he says, well, there's proof of all this fraudulent voting in it, but I have yet to see any proof. Um, We've had nothing but good results out of these systems. And he is, as well as the other commission, they've all been elected on these systems. I got an email from Dominion, and Dominion said that they're going to allow us three county commissioners to inspect the machines. Yeah, I was going to say, Robin says that you guys are invited to go look at them. And, and that would be like me going to inspect a rocket ship. I know nothing about it. I don't. I so can go. I can go look. At, I can. An outside forensics expert, disqualified. When we spoke with Griffin, he was still in office, and before his removal, he was already signaling that he would refuse to certify the next batch of election results. Are you going to certify the election results in November? That's to be determined. If it sits where it stands right now, I won't. You know, I didn't. I held the line right after getting out of federal court in Washington, D.C., the very same day that I was sentenced. I had a vote that afternoon by telephone, and I still voted no because I'm willing to make the sacrifice. I'm willing to go the extra mile. I'm willing to lay it all down for my country and for the future of our country, which is what every American should do and what so many Americans have done. Thank you.
Liz Landers is with me now for more. Liz, so Coy Griffin there, he's no longer an elected official. He's done. So what's happened since you did that interview? Well, when we were with Coy in New Mexico, he was um, being deposed in a lawsuit to remove him from office. This liberal watchdog group out of D.C. crew brought a civil lawsuit against him to remove him from office uh, using Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which basically says that if you participate in a rebellion against the government, you can no longer serve in office. That is stuck around from the Civil War. And now people are trying to use it to remove some of these people that were at the Capitol on January 6th from public office. Um, A judge determined that that case and that argument was strong enough to remove Coy from office. I talked to him moments after that decision uh, was released and he said he was shocked, but he had no regrets about his activity and uh, his conduct on January 6th. And it kind of shows you how much of a true believer of some of these uh, Trump folks and these election deniers really are. So Liz, Griffin might not be the last to be ousted for his participation in January 6th. So what other dominoes might fall here? I think that we're probably going to see more um, watchdog groups and potentially more private citizens uh, bring these kinds of civil lawsuits against people who attended the January 6th insurrection who are public officials. This has been used already against Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene and Congressman uh, Madison Cawthorn. Those were unsuccessful attempts. But I do think that uh, we might see this in the future against other public officials. Liz Landers, thanks for joining us. Coming up, the costly legal jeopardy the former president and his inner circle find themselves in after years of trying to subvert American democracy and how they're milking everything they can out of their supporters to foot the bill. This is Breaking the Vote. I'm Todd Zwillick. In this current iteration of American democracy, you need money to become the nation's leader, a lot of it. But here's a question, what's the price of attempting to overturn an election? It's something those behind the failed coup are finding out the hard way as they learn that there's literally a price to be paid for perpetuating those stolen election lies. Here's Vice's James Hamilton on the grifting underway by those still unable to let go of their election denying past as they try to stave off a costly future of lawyers and legal bills. Trying to steal an election, it turns out, really only guarantees you one thing, legal fees. Lots and lots of legal fees. It's something former President Trump and his crew have found out, that you either get creative in covering those court fees, or, according to one former White House advisor, you stop eating human food. This is going to cost a half a million dollars from what I'm being told. And I have a choice to make about, you know, that's going to basically wipe out my retirement savings. and I'll be eating dog food if I stay out of jail. Trump's helpers, fixers, lawyers and fanboys have been scrambling to keep their plates dog food free pretty much since last summer when Congress launched its special investigation into January 6th. Where it gets tricky is figuring out who's getting money through a grift, as in questionably legal, and who's getting it through something more like a swindle, meaning they're not breaking the law, but they're also not telling the truth. Take lawyer and alleged January 6th co-conspirator John Eastman. He's gone to court in hopes of keeping his phone out of the hands of investigators, and he's funding it with the same self-declared Christian crowdfunding site that has also helped raise money for Canada's trucker convoy, QAnon supporters, and Proud Boys. Eastman's fund's descriptions say he's being targeted by, quote, hardcore leftist activists, and it links to an article called Who Are the Real Insurrectionists? which is basically saying, I know you are, but what am I? It seems the scare tactics worked. Eastman originally asked for $150,000 and he's now raised over $240,000 and counting. Donors have left comments cheering his fight against so-called evil and occasionally listing themselves anonymously, only to sign their names in the comments. Former Trump advisor and forever friend Roger Stone has also turned to his supporters. Stone started fundraising on his own website back in 2017 as the Mueller investigation picked up. Five years, seven felony convictions, and one presidential pardon later, Stone is still collecting that sweet, sweet cash. His website makes it clear, any donation is considered a gift to Stone, meaning he can technically do whatever he wants with it. Though these days, most of that money will go towards legal fees, 
and settling a lawsuit from the Department of Justice saying he owes almost $2 million in unpaid taxes. And if crowdfunding isn't enough, Stone has also tried a trendier way of getting money. At the end of last year, he tried to sell an NFT of a magazine cover from 1990 signed by Trump that says, to Roger, you are the greatest. If someone bid over $20,000, they would apparently also get the physical copy of the magazine too. Though that seemingly wasn't an exciting enough perk because it looks like the auction ended without a sale. Then there's Trump's economic advisor and man whose greatest fear is eating dog food, Peter Navarro. He's been charged with being in contempt of Congress after ignoring a subpoena. Navarro's made the rounds on TV in part to push his new book, which he says will help him with legal fees and once again, protect his retirement. I've got to raise that money. I, I, I can't kill my retirement by, by defending this, this, these baseless charges. Navarro is like some of Trump's other allies who now find themselves being held in contempt, saying they shouldn't be in trouble in the first place. Navarro says Trump's executive privilege gives him, Navarro, legal immunity, which is not how that works. But Trump and his guys have a history of treating executive privilege like some people treat old milk. You can't know it's actually expired unless you've given it a try. Now that Navarro is in trouble, he's also getting help from the Save America PAC, a PAC controlled by Trump. Save America PAC and Make America Great PAC, another Trump-controlled fund, have paid out more than $2 million combined just this year to law firms representing Trump loyalists who've been connected to January 6th and have refused to cooperate with the committee's investigation. Save America PAC has helped pay lawyers representing Steve Bannon, Mark Meadows, and former special assistant Dan Scavino. The PAC was paying for a lawyer for Cassidy Hutchinson too, but when it was clear she was going to testify, she was forced to get a different lawyer. But if you're not a big name witness, there's money for you too. The American Conservative Union has a legal defense stash called the First Amendment Fund that helps some aides who get subpoenaed. The ACU's chairman says the fund has, quote, over seven figures from donors. More than a dozen witnesses have gotten help from this fund, and anyone else hoping to get in on the action has to prove at least one simple point. They can't agree with the committee's mission, and they certainly can't cooperate with it. Members of the committee have pointed out that criteria could lead to witnesses being coerced to stay loyal. Throwing PAC money around isn't illegal, and paying to keep sycophants happy so they don't rat out the leader of a political party makes some kind of sense in a cynical, wicked sort of way. But that's not the only thing that's shady about these political slush funds. Throughout the committee's investigation, we found evidence that the Trump campaign and its surrogates misled donors as to where their funds would go and what they would be used for. So not only was there the big lie, there was the big ripoff. Ripoff or not, one thing's clear. Trump and his dudes need to raise a lot of money because they're being accused of a lot of crimes while stretching the truth or straight up lying to do it. Just ahead, we sit down with former Attorney General Eric Holder and talk about the threats hitting democracy, plus whether he would urge the current Attorney General to indict Donald Trump. More Breaking the Vote when we're back. He's a civil rights leader who served as the country's top prosecutor. What former Attorney General Eric Holder now says about the battles over the Justice Department he once led, the criminal investigations into Donald Trump, and attacks on our democracy. Our democracy is under attack. I'm not being hyperbolic. I'm not being alarmist. Um, but the reality is that we have election deniers running for governor, um, running for secretaries of state, uh, running for at local uh, levels. Uh, too much uh, of one party is um, turning its back on democracy and is embracing really authoritarian ideas. That's coming up later in the show. Plus, we've been learning more and more about the long running and convoluted plan to reverse the outcome of the 2020 election through those fake electors. But up next, more than 60% of Americans will have an election denier on the ballot this fall. That's according to 538. These are secretaries of state, governors, members of Congress, local officials, all vying for office while backing the claim that the 2020 election was stolen from Trump. In some cases, these are people who've taken legal action to overturn the 2020 results. 
But do they have a chance to get elected in November? And just how much damage can they do to our democratic system? Cameron Joseph has that report. Former President Donald Trump set out to stack the GOP decks with allies for the midterm elections. And by and large, he's essentially succeeded. There are six key swing states where Trump fought hard to overturn his 2020 losses. Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. In those states, 15 of the 21 candidates Republicans have nominated for governor, senator, secretary of state, and attorney general have embraced Trump's lies about the 2020 election. That's nearly three quarters of the candidates. There's at least one election denying conspiracy theorist nominated statewide in every single one of these swing states. That includes the GOP candidate for governor in three of these states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Arizona. Anybody who was involved in that corrupt, shady, shoddy election of 2020, lock them up. And it gets even worse when we're talking about secretaries of state, the candidates who actually run their state's elections. If Republicans sweep this fall, five of the six swing states could have election conspiracy theorists running their own elections. In fact, the entire statewide GOP ticket in Arizona is made up of election deniers. That would be remarkable if only Michigan didn't have the exact same deal. And it runs even deeper than that. According to the Washington Post, more than 60% of all GOP candidates in these states are election deniers. Do you think the elections were fair? The problem is that the American people don't have all the answers because the media is part of the problem. I think Trump won in 2020. There's no evidence, though, of widespread okay. voter fraud. That is area. absolutely crap, and you know it. You didn't look at the findings. I did read the yeah. findings. And a bunch of these Secretary of State candidates aren't just election deniers. They're playing footsie with QAnon. They've teamed up with QAnon influencers to form a coalition of like-minded candidates. And in case you think this is all for show, some of these candidates actually do seem to believe the crazy QAnon conspiracy theories they're yelling about. There's a lot of people involved in, in a pedophile network and the distribution of children. And that makes me absolutely sick. And unfortunately, there's a whole lot of elected officials that are involved in that. Now, not every Republican nominee has been willing to back Trump's fraud claims. Dr. Oz has danced around it for months in his forever flailing Pennsylvania Senate race. And Nevada governor nominee Joe Lombardo has said Biden won, though he has said Democrats made voting fraud easier. And Georgia is the big exception. Republican Governor Brian Kemp, Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, and Attorney General Chris Carr all won primaries over Trump-backed conspiracists. Even there, Trump got his man in the Senate race with Herschel Walker. He's one of the four swing state GOP nominees who have embraced Trump's election lies. But I can guarantee you Joe Biden didn't get 50 million people vote for him, but yet people think that he's won this election. And don't forget about the attorneys general. They're the ones who actually bring criminal prosecutions if local wackadoos violate campaign laws. Or they can join wild lawsuits trying to overturn their side's election loss, like 17 different Republican AGs did in 2020. And four of the five GOP nominees for attorney general in these states are election deniers. Nowhere is this choice starker than in Michigan. Democratic AG Dana Nessel has been investigating a group that includes former Trump campaign lawyer Matt DiPerno for allegedly gaining unauthorized access to voting machines in a handful of counties after the last election. She looked all set to bring charges until Republicans nominated DiPerno to run against her this fall. Now she's asked for a special prosecutor so there's no conflict of interest. Of course, not all of these candidates are going to win. These are swing states after all, and their out there views make it harder for them. But here's the thing. All of these conspiracy theorists don't need to win to wreak havoc on American democracy. Just a few of them getting into positions of power could sow chaos for their states of 2024 results. The more of these candidates that win, the more chances there are for serious threats to free and fair elections, and the higher the risk grows that the next presidential election will make the chaos of 2020 look like a warm up. Welcome back to Breaking the Vote. Coups aren't always violent. In fact, they really don't need to be in order to succeed. And despite appearances on January 6th, the vice president's election certifying role isn't the most troubling part of our 240-year-old system of government. Here's Liz Landers on the small but glaringly obvious issue at the heart of our great electoral experiment. 
Democracy is under attack from every direction. It has been for years, and we've been covering it. And there's a small window in which the country can make sure those attacks don't succeed. That window, however, starts to close a bit more in November. While institutions start to splinter and crack before voters' eyes, there's one part of the country's centuries-old democratic republic that has stood the test of time and will likely continue to. But that isn't necessarily a good thing. Political scientists, lawmakers, voters, even late-night comedy hosts have called the current system unrepresentative or undemocratic while shouting out loud about the one big glaring instance of false advertising underpinning the country's great experiment. America is not a one-person, one-vote democracy and never has been. The question is, does a seemingly outdated 200-year-old system actually function? Is it equitable? The answer is pretty simple, no. Enter the Electoral College. Consider this, because of the Electoral College, one of the two major parties needs 52% of the vote to have even a 50-50 chance of winning the presidency. It's the Democrats. Which helps explain why two recent presidents, both Republicans, lost the popular vote but won the White House. The Electoral College is also one reason why political campaigns are pandering to older and mostly white voters in swing states like New Hampshire, Colorado, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. They literally have more sway and power. So how did we get here? Defenders of the Electoral College say the Founding Fathers wanted to protect the nation from mob rule and to make sure that less populous states get a voice. Let's be honest though, depending on where you look now, mob rule is exactly what some voters have. But that's not the whole story, because this system was also born from slavery, racism. In the late 1700s, the Electoral College was backed by whites in southern slave-holding states so they could include enslaved people in their population count, but deny those people the vote. The system would give slave owners and their supporters outsized political power in this fledgling so-called democracy. But today, undemocratic minority rule can be found in many parts of the country, particularly in one pretty powerful governing body, the US Senate. Take for example that more people live in California than in these 21 states combined. Yet Californians get just two Senate votes, while voters in these smaller states get 42 combined Senate votes. That means some Americans have more than 20 times the voting power of others. And the results are stark. The US Senate is now six to seven percentage points redder than the country it's supposed to represent. Yeah, 100% of my focus is on stopping this new administration. And just look at what's become of the most activist Supreme Court in a generation, where five out of nine of those justices who dismantled reproductive rights and are set to make landmark rulings on free speech, race and college admissions, and states' powers in federal elections were appointed by presidents who lost the popular vote. So is it fair to say our political system is becoming more undemocratic? That it doesn't reflect the will of the people? That it's broken? Maybe, but one thing's for sure. There are those out there trying to make that dystopian idea a reality. Up next, Eric Holder tells us how those centuries-old democratic structures need to be replaced plus the threat that wannabe autocrats are having on the country and whether there's any way to stop them. American democracy is in a crisis. And with these coming midterm elections, we're now at an inflection point. Former U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder says that what we're facing is no less than an existential national emergency and that the time to act is now. Holder served in the Obama administration and he was the first African-American attorney general in U.S. history. I talked to him about how the vote is broken and his blueprint for fixing it, which he lays out in his new book, Our Unfinished March. Mr. Attorney General, Eric Holder, thanks for joining us. Sure, glad to be with you. Well, uh, democracy is under threat. There are election deniers and conspiracists running for office all over America. There was just an attempted coup in this country. 
Uh, it's a hell of a time to come out with a book about American democracy. Yeah, um, unfortunately, our timing was good. Um, the, our democracy is under attack. I'm not being hyperbolic. I'm not being alarmist. Um, but the reality is that we have election deniers running for governor, um, running for secretaries of state, uh, running for at local uh, levels. Uh, too much uh, of one party is um, turning its back on democracy and is embracing really authoritarian ideas. What's the state of this, I'll call it a fight for now, for democracy? What's the state of it in this country? Are pro-democratic forces up to the battle right now? I think pro-democratic forces are up to the battle, and I think that uh, you see increasing numbers of people uh, moving to the pro-democracy side as they understand um, what is at stake and what the impact of this battle has on their lives on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Are people outraged about it? Are they outraged enough about it? Yeah, I mean, I think we certainly, if you look at the Democratic Party and progressives in 2011, not up to the task. And uh, we suffered that whole decade a as a result. Uh, when we formed up the National Democratic Redistricting Committee in 2017, yeah, I I'd say that at that point, people, you know, would, their eyes would glaze over when I started talking about, um, about gerrymandering. But I think people have now gotten to the point where they understand um, what the impact is on their day-to-day -day lives when it comes to reproductive choice, um, criminal justice reform, climate, uh, protecting the right to vote. All of these things are impacted um, by gerrymandering, and I think people get it now. In 2009, the Obama administration, Democrats had control of the House, control of the Senate, control of the White House. They didn't pass voting rights legislation. They didn't protect voting rights at that time. Did you do enough? We certainly did what we could to protect um, voting rights, bringing cases that um, we, we could under the Voting Rights Act. Um, I think it's safe to say, however, that I certainly did not anticipate that the court would do what it did in the 2013 Shelby County case to really gut the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, one of the worst decisions I think we've ever seen in Supreme Court history. You wrote in your book that when that decision came down, 2013, Shelby v. Holder. I know you don't like to yeah. talk about the second part. I only part. call it the Shelby County case. I don't want my name associated with that abomination at all. That, all right, let me ask you about something more current. Okay. Mar-a-Lago. Mm -hmm. have to talk about it. You are in a unique position to really bring us on the inside of some of these decisions that are being made. We've all read the warrant document, potential violations of the Espionage Act, potential um, obstruction. Uh, is Donald Trump in trouble? I mean, Donald Trump is in a world of, of trouble. Um, he, he's, in a, he's, he's facing a, a big mess from his, his perspective. You know, the, the case that's being considered by the local prosecutor, the Fulton County prosecutor in, in Georgia, is um, that's a substantial case. I mean, he's on tape saying, find me 11,780 votes. What we have seen elicited by the January 6th committee um, shows his involvement in the, um, the attempted coup. My guess is that um, as time passes, more information will be found. Um, you know, his lawyers, we now hear, have gone before a, a grand jury. They're not gonna lie. One, one thing that's come out in the aftermath of the Mar-a-Lago search is I think I read a survey that said 41% of people considered that to be a politically motivated abuse of power. 41% seems like a, a crisis of confidence in the Justice Department and in the FBI. The Trump base is, they believe everything that Donald Trump says. It's all misinformation. Their whole party is based on misinformation. And everything he's been, Russia, and those who surrounded him, and I think people in the Republican Party have been irresponsible in the way Trump. in which they've characterized what happened. And that's something that really pisses me off, you know, this notion that somehow or other you're going to go after federal agents and imply that they were planting information, you know, let out the names of the people, the agents who were involved in this process, knowing full well that that meant that they were going to be put in danger. Uh, the next time the Republican Party and leaders of that party and Donald Trump say that they are law and order people, I hope the American people will remember how they treated people in law enforcement um, around this, this Mar-a-Lago incident. This is something that really, really, really makes me angry. I think all people of conscience were shocked by the violence on January 6th, the riot, the breaking into the Capitol, all of that. And since then, we've learned so much more about how broad 
and how deep the coup plot really was. What pissed you off more? The bid to take over the Justice Department and politicize it for a coup or threatening DOJ personnel and the FBI? That's a hard one. Uh, I think I would have the same level of pissed offedness to the extent that there is such a word, um, you know, to try to politicize one of the most powerful agencies in the executive branch. The way in which people in law enforcement, in uniform, were treated um, on that day. Um, the way in which the former president apparently waited for hours before he decided to come out and then give that half-hearted um, speech. So go home. We love you. You're very special. And then as the January 6th committee has uh, done its work and to find out you know, who was involved, the breadth and the depth of the, um, of the coup conspiracy, um, that has, has angered me as well. You have people who just need a little bit, a bit of a push to have the lives threatened of people in the Justice Department, FBI agents, potentially um, lawyers. And then you end up with some idiot trying to storm an FBI office in Cincinnati, Ohio, and he loses his life as a result of that. That's on the hands of the people who have been irresponsible in their reactions to what was a justified law enforcement action. That gives me great concern as well. So both of them, both of them um, piss me off. The reality is that this movement mounted violence on January 6th. There's violence after Mar-a-Lago. They seem to be promising more to come. Yeah, but so, but what do you do? I mean, you know, if you are concerned that we can't hold them responsible because we fear violence, well, that in some ways just validates what it is that they did and makes it more likely that uh, what they did on January the 6th and afterwards uh, will be replicated in the future. Now, people need to be held accountable. That's one of the aims of the criminal law. But another important part of the criminal law is to deter people from engaging in similar conduct. And so if we want 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, to try to ensure the peaceful transfer of power, people who acted inappropriately uh, around January the 6th, before it and after it, uh, have to be held accountable. Are you worried they might also be violence producing if there's accountability for those things? People on the fringe who've been activated um, by the irresponsible language that has been used by, um, by, by too many. That's what gives me concern. And so when I say, yeah, you know, we can reduce it, but I'm also realistic that we have to be prepared uh, to deal with not only threats, but, um, but action by, um, you know, some segments of our population. But, but I guess my, my thought is that, you know, we're not finished with these anger-producing revelations. Um, the January 6th committee is gonna continue. Um, it's work. I suspect we're going to hear more um, negative things. Christopher Wray, the, the head of the, the FBI, uh, said in some form or fashion that his primary concern, his main concern, was domestic terrorism. And what we have seen in the United States uh, is a term that we've used overseas, but I think we need to bring home. We've seen the radicalization, you know, the radicalization of, of certain parts of our society. And these radicalized people pose, I think, a clear and present danger um, to our nation. That does it for this edition of Breaking the Vote. When we're back, how manufacturing fear operates for political gain. We'll look at the targets of the fear mongering and the fear mongers too. Plus, how that good old fear and intimidation are at work to root out the workers and officials that make our elections function. Make sure to sign up for our weekly Breaking the Vote newsletter at vice.com slash breaking the vote. And we'll see you next time. I'm Michael Learmonth, Editor-in-Chief of Vice News. Too often, traditional news outlets shy away from the real stories and experiences of those living through global conflicts, not Vice News. Our reporters are on the ground, fearlessly covering the human stories that shape our world. You and millions of others can continue to read, watch, and listen to Vice News for free. But we hope you'll consider making a one-time or ongoing contribution of any size at vice.com slash contribute. Every contribution, no matter how big or small, helps support the journalism Vice News brings to you every day. Thank you.